Anne Bill Kidd. Time is up on general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, the Education Secretary took issue with us raising questions about Scottish education in the Chamber, so I'd like to return to the matter. Mr Swinney claimed recently that there has been no narrowing of subject choice for senior pupils in Scotland. Indeed, he said choice is blossoming and that the options available to young people are colossal. So can I ask the First Minister where the evidence is for that? First Minister. Well, perhaps I could quote her own education spokesperson, Liz Smith, who a couple of weeks ago at uh, the relevant committee said there is more choice for young people. So there is some evidence. Uh, but I think the best evidence of how our education system is performing are the results that our young people are achieving. Whether we look at level five qualifications, level six qualifications, the numbers of young people getting more than five hires, uh, whether we look at the narrowing of the attainment gap, we find improvement in all of these measures. And that takes me to, I think, the flaw in Ruth Davidson's argument. She wants to uh, tell people that there's something terribly wrong in our education system. Unfortunately, the pupils of Scotland are proving her wrong by doing better each and every year. Ruth Davidson. The First Minister talks about the number of qualifications gained, but what she doesn't say is that the number of A to C grades has actually dropped on her watch by 3%. But we've asked for the evidence on subject choice, and here's what we've found. We got results from every school in Scotland setting out the average number of qualifications taken by pupils in S4 over the last few years. Not just Nat 4 and 5, but every single qualification taken. In 2013, when Curriculum for Excellence was introduced, there were 308 secondary schools where pupils took an average of seven or more qualifications at S4. By 2018, that figure had fallen to just 182, a drop of more than 40%. And by contrast, the number of schools where pupils took six subjects or fewer has gone up from just 46 in 2013 to 165. So to go back to the Education Secretary's comments, does that sound like blossoming choice to the First Minister? First Minister. So as we have discussed many times in this chamber, it is not simply a matter of the qualifications that young people take in S4. What matters are the qualifications young people leave school with, the qualifications they take over the entirety of the senior phase of education. Let me quote the head of education at Aberdeenshire Council, uh, Tory led Aberdeenshire Council. Young people mature at different rates and having qualifications available to them over a three year period gives much greater flexibility and allows them to learn at a stage when they are ready. It's the entirety of the senior phase that matters. Uh, and the facts are these. Uh, at level five, we see the percentage of pupils getting qualifications increasing. At level six, we see it increasing. Uh, in 2009, 22% of young people left school with five hires or more. That is now more than 30% of pupils and we're seeing the attainment gap narrow. So again, I come back to this fundamental point. Uh, the evidence does not bear out Ruth Davidson's analysis. The evidence is of an education system that is improving and young people that are doing better. Ruth Davidson. Well, to be fair, presiding officer, I wasn't expecting a completely impartial answer from the first minister. So in anticipation, we decided instead to seek one out this morning. And we put all of this to Professor Jim Scott, the former head teacher, who's probably spent more time than anyone examining changes of subject choice in Scotland. And he says that this data confirms that since the introduction of Curriculum for Excellence, just over 200 schools have declines or significant declines in the number of entries for SQA qualifications, whereas just over 50 demonstrate an increase. Does the First Minister accept that? Or is that all part of some great Moonfest conspiracy too? First Minister. Well, again, much of the analysis that Professor Scott uh, has done has looked at qualifications at S4 and the fundamental point we are making here is that while of course that is important it is the qualifications young people leave school with and we are seeing more people at uh, young people leave school with more qualifications we're seeing the gap between the richest and the poorest narrow we're seeing uh, a report from our commissioner for fair access uh, just this week uh, saying that we're making significant progress in narrowing the attainment gap 
in terms of young people going on into university. And of course, we've got a record number of young people going into positive destinations overall. So we will continue to work hard to make this progress in education. But no matter how much Ruth Davidson wants to talk down the performance of Scottish education, the facts, quite frankly, are proving her wrong. Ruth Davidson. Presiding officer, if we're going to improve education in this country, we need to accept information and evidence, whether that's on combined classes or on subject choice being restricted. And the First Minister and the Education Secretary need to listen. Because this isn't just down to schools exercising choice, it's schools not having enough teachers or support to provide full choice. And it's children from disadvantaged areas suffering the most because they are still the ones most likely to leave school at the end of S4. The Parliament is already conducting an inquiry into this matter, so can I ask the First Minister, will she and her Education Secretary spend a bit less time attacking the messengers and a bit more time listening to the evidence that they come forward with? First Minister. Well, we'll continue to spend time looking at the evidence. So, Ruth Davidson uh, never quite manages to respond to the actual evidence. So let me set it out for her again. When this government took office, uh, just over 70% of young people uh, left school with a level five qualification. That's now 86%. Uh, at level six, when we took office, it was just over 41%. Now it's 62%. 22% in 2009 leaving school with five hires or more, now over 30%. Uh, and we see the gap in attainment narrowing. These are the facts. Ruth Davidson doesn't like them because they don't suit her. Now let's go on to teacher numbers. There are more teachers in our schools uh, now than at any time since 2010. Uh, there are more primary school <laughs> teachers in our schools than at any time since I was at primary school. Um, and I have to say, Ruth Davidson's got a bit of a cheek talking about numbers of teachers in our schools when she's the leader of the austerity party in Scotland. And the leader of the party that would give, that would give tax cuts to the richest and therefore take money out of our education system. So we'll get on with the job of improving education and we'll leave Ruth Davidson to defend whatever latest Tory ends up imposing austerity on Scotland. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, this week, our pensioners faced a direct attack on their living standards when the BBC announced it plans to scrap universal free TV licences to the over 75s. The Scottish Pensioners Forum said that this is a decision, and I quote, potentially plunging older people into a solitary existence with no means of contact with the outside world. They are right. So will the First Minister add her name to a letter that I am circulating to all party leaders in this parliament today calling on Theresa May in one of her final acts as Prime Minister to take back responsibility, to honour their 2017 manifesto pledge and reverse this decision because our pensioners deserve so much better than this. First Minister. Um, well, I'm very happy to look at any letter that Richard Leonard wants to send me, but I have to say the Scottish Government, as far as I understand it, has already written to the Government uh, on this matter, making clear our... Uh, so we haven't waited uh, until today. We've, uh, I think, got on and done it. But yes, we will look at any cross-party action. Um, I oppose the decision that's been taken by the BBC. But let me say this, and I think uh, Richard Leonard alluded to this as well. The BBC have been left to take this decision. Yep. Uh, um, uh, the responsibility for the decision lies fairly and squarely with the Tory government at Westminster. Uh, so let's all in this chamber, and I would challenge the Tories yeah. as well to stand oh, up exactly. um, and back, back the continuation all of free TV licences for all pensioners, not just in Scotland, but across the UK. Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, but our pensioners suffered another blow this week when the Scottish Government voted to slow down and water down its plans to end fuel poverty. Back in 2008, addressing this Parliament, Nicola Sturgeon said, and I quote, I reiterate the Scottish Government's continued commitment to tackling fuel poverty and to meet the 2016 target, which is to ensure, as far as reasonably practicable, that no one is living in fuel poverty by 2016. 
But instead of eradicating fuel poverty by 2016, the First Minister now wants to eradicate it by 2040. Instead of a definition of vulnerability that extends to all pensioners, the Scottish Government has now excluded everybody below the age of 75, even though life expectancy in Scotland's most disadvantaged communities is less than 75. First Minister, when will all of Scotland's pensioners finally be lifted out of poverty? First Minister. Um, I'm slightly confused because uh, I understand that Labour voted for the yeah. fuel poverty yeah. bill uh, this week, but it seems a bit strange that uh, Richard Leonard now seems to oppose it. Uh, but let me just say to Richard Leonard, if we look at the la latest figures published uh, in December last year, they show Scotland's fuel poverty rate at the lowest uh, recorded rate since 2000. And five. Uh, but we have work to do. All of us have work to do. Uh, that's why we have passed uh, this piece of legislation. Scotland is amongst only a handful of uh, European governments to define fuel poverty, let alone set targets relating to its eradication. So we will continue to work to make sure that we do eradicate fuel poverty. The targets we've set this week will focus us on doing exactly that. And I hope that we've got the support of Scottish Labour, not just in passing the targets, but also in taking the action we'll, that makes sure that we can meet those targets. And Richard Leonard. Well, presiding officer, the facts are these. Pensioner poverty up. Free TV licences under attack. Care and support needs unmet. Life expectancy in Scotland falling. The promise to end fuel poverty broken. Presiding officer, the way we treat our elderly citizens is a mark of the kind of society we are. These are people who have contributed all of their working lives. Many of them are still contributing today as unpaid carers, yet too many of them are forced to choose between heating and eating. First Minister, your target date to end fuel poverty was 2016, now it's 2040. Does the First Minister appreciate the anger that will be felt by pensioners when they realise not just what the Tories are doing this week, but what this government has done this week. First Minister. Well, we will continue being one of the only governments across Europe setting targets to eradicate fuel poverty. But let me say to uh, Richard Leonard, the regulation of energy prices in this country is a reserved yeah. matter. Yeah. Pensions. Pensions are a reserved yeah. matter. BBS. Television licences are a reserved matter. Yeah. So if Richard Leonard wants this government to have responsibility over all of these matters, he'll find that I'm the first to agree with him. So having reversed his position on a second EU referendum at the weekend, maybe he'll now see the light and reverse his position on a second independence referendum so that this parliament can take control of these matters out of the hands of the Tories and serve our pensioners along with the rest of our country as well. We have a number of constituency supplementaries. Uh, Claire Adamson to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you may be aware of reports that the World, First World War Memorial in the Duchess of Hamilton Park in my constituency has been vandalised. My great uncle is remembered on this memorial. Do you share my disgust at this abhorrent act, especially in such close pro proximity to the 75th DD landing commemorations? And will you join in me in sending a message that hate crimes, hate behaviours have no place in a modern Scotland and urge those responsible to reflect on the hurt they have caused to my constituents and urge them to come forward and take responsibility for their actions? First Minister. Can I thank Claire Adamson for raising this issue? I was uh, extremely disappointed, indeed disgusted, uh, to hear of the vandalism of the World War I memorial in Motherwell, and I join with Claire Adamson and with others in condemning such a wicked and despicable act. Uh, and that this did happen at a time when we have been commemorating the sacrifices made by our armed forces uh, makes it all the more abhorrent. Uh, obviously, the police are investigating this. I would call on the perpetrators to reflect on their behaviour and to come forward. Uh, but I would also agree uh, with Claire Adamson that all of us must join in sending a very clear message that hate crime has no place in Scotland and it will simply not be tolerated. Thank you, Paul. 
Brian Whittle, to be followed by Ross Greer. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, presenting officer. Uh, a charity in my area waiting for European Social Fund payments contacted me to say they are struggling with the costs and only found out there is an issue with the fund when they read about it in a national newspaper. Given the third sector's limited budget and need to control cash flow, does the First Minister think this is an acceptable way for the Scottish Government to communicate with the third sector? And while they're trying to resolve their administration issues with the fund, perhaps the Scottish Government can, would consider paying their proportion of the grant in advance. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government met with the Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations uh, just yesterday, in fact, to update them on the situation and provide further reassurance. The concerns relate, of course, to evidence provided by lead partners in these projects. That it is a common issue with European social funding. Similar problems have been identified in England, but we are determined to avoid any charity or third sector body suffering as a result of this. We continue to make payments to projects unaffected by these issues, and we are working to resolve the situation as quickly as possible with the European Commission. We have already sent a list of proposed solutions to the Commission and await confirmation that it is content to accept them. And these proposals will then ensure that lead partners in the various projects are able to generate the evidence that they need to support their claim for payment. So the government is and will continue to do everything to resolve this situation as quickly as possible. Ross Greer to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister might be aware of proposals by Peel Ports for a significant development adjacent to the Hunterston nuclear power station in my region. The proposals are varied. Some of them are very interesting and could potentially provide much needed jobs. But the one that's providing serious concern for local residents is that for liquefied natural gas for a terminal, a storage facility and a new gas fire power station. Does the First Minister agree that new gas fire power stations in Scotland are not compatible with her declaration of a climate emergency? First Minister. Uh, well, I certainly uh, appreciate and uh, echo the sentiments uh, of Ross Greer around uh, the climate emergency. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are doing everything uh, possible to meet uh, that challenge. Uh, in terms of uh, proposed developments, it, uh, as Ros Greer is aware, they will have to go through uh, a whole uh, series uh, of applications and considerations, and it would not be correct for me to preempt any of that. But certainly, uh, in terms of our energy policy, and I think this is evidenced across our energy policy, uh, the commitment of this government to tackle climate change and reduce our emissions, I think, is very well evidenced. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. I know that the First Minister is aware of the situation at St Ambrose and Buchanan High Schools in my constituency, and I wholeheartedly welcome the announcement yesterday from John Swinney that there will be an independent, impartial review. But given that over 400 people attended a public meeting that I arranged last week, and over 14,000 folk have now signed an online petition, what reassurances can the First Minister give that the review will involve hearing the views of parents and school staff? And will the review's public health lead have the power to order appropriate tests and investigations to get a full understanding of the safety of the site? First Minister. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to address this issue, which I know is uh, causing considerable concern to parents, despite the efforts of the Council and the Health Board to assure people of the safety of the school. That's why uh, we announced the independent review yesterday. The review will engage with parents, teachers, staff and perhaps most importantly of all pupils in the schools, exactly how the review is taken forward is rightly a matter for the review itself, given the importance of ensuring its independence. Uh, on the question of testing, uh, the same is true. Uh, let me make clear if the review's experts conclude that there is a need to recommend further tests on the site itself or with appropriate parental permission, the pupils, then that is exactly what will happen. Uh, but we must respect the review's independence and allow them to come to their own conclusions. I think that is a critical point about this work. The review must both be independent and impartial and be seen to be independent and impartial. Nothing less will be acceptable to staff, parents and pupils, and nothing less will be acceptable to the government either. Annie Wells. In my region of Glasgow and in the First Minister's own constituency, a school has been forced to take desperate action to eliminate a four-year long ordeal of bedbug infestations. Kids are getting rashes, pest control teams are visiting every few months and staff have had to destroy their home furniture. First Minister, what century is this? First Minister. This is an issue in uh, different parts of Glasgow. I know from my uh, constituency interest uh, in the case that Annie Wells is citing, 
uh, the intensive work that is being done uh, by the Council. I uh, speak to Council officials on uh, these matters uh, regularly and the, the other issues that are raised uh, in this area of my constituency. And I know the work that is going on is uh, very intensive. Uh, and I think all of us have to encourage uh, those uh, involved in this uh, to follow all of the guidelines in order uh, that the work that's been done has the best chance of succeeding. And question number three, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Like me, the First Minister will have received hundreds of emails from constituents this week backing calls for 11% of NHS funding to go to general practice, to let our local surgeries employ more doctors and nurses, to provide longer appointments and to tackle the health inequality that continues to blight Scotland. In April, Parliament voted for the Green Motion to demanding an urgent review of GP recruitment, resources and funding. So when will the Scottish Government respect the will of Parliament and launch such a review? First Minister. Well, we're taking a range of actions uh, to boost recruitment into general practice. In terms of funding, the Government is committed uh, to increasing the proportion of funding going to primary care services uh, to 11%. Uh, Half of that will go to uh, GPs in particular, but of course GPs do not work in isolation. Uh, increasingly, it's the entire primary care team that is important in terms of delivering the services and communities that people need and shifting the balance of care from acute services to primary care. So we uh, continue to work uh, to achieve that aim and we continue to work across the different ways, uh, the different actions that we are taking to ensure that we are recruiting the right numbers of people, not just into general practice, but into different professions across our health service. Alison Johnson. Um, uh, the fact is the overwhelming majority of patient contacts are made with our GPs, yet they receive less than 8% of the NHS budget. 11% may be going to primary care. The call is that 11% goes to GP practices. They're overstretched and under-resourced. A quarter of GPs don't think they'll be in general practice five years from now. And the RCGP are warning that this is putting patient safety at risk, this untenable situation. If we want to look after people in their homes and communities, rather than in our hospitals, we need more GPs. The RCGP says that surgeries will struggle to deliver the health care we need with it, without at least 11% of NHS funding. Are the GPs wrong? First Minister. continue to talk to and work with GPs. I understand the Health Secretary will meet with the Royal College shortly to have further discussions about their report. We're taking a range of actions in terms of recruitment. The number of trainee doctors, for example, has increased by more than 10% since 2007, and the majority of uh, new places are focused on primary care and general uh, practice. Uh, the number of trainee GPs in 2018 was its highest level for over a decade. So we'll continue to take those actions. In terms of funding, we have the commitment to increase the share of funding going to primary care, and we will meet that commitment. General practice is a vital part of that, but I think of, as anybody uh, who understands how the health service uh, works will know, and uh, I know Alison Johnson knows this, general uh, practice does not work in isolation. They are part of mu a multidisciplinary team. So increasing the share of funding going to primary care uh, not just helps the entirety of the primary care team, it also helps general practice because it has tasks that might currently be done by GPs able to be done by other members of the team. So this is an important commitment and we'll continue to make progress in meeting it. And some further supplementaries. The first from Joanne Lamont to be followed by Sandra White. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. The First Minister will, will be aware of the advanced payment scheme for older survivors of in-care child abuse. In a recent written answer to me, the Cabinet Secretary for Education said that no application to the scheme had been refused. Some survivors, however, are reporting that applications have been refused on the grounds that they do not have the documents to prove where they were in care. And of course, we know that some organisations running children's homes destroyed many of their historical records. May I ask the First Minister to have this investigated as a matter of urgency, given the distress this may be causing to people who throughout their lives have had their trust betrayed? First Minister. Well, as I, I hope Joanne Lamont will recognise this is a very important issue that has been taken very seriously by the government. We owe a debt uh, to these people and we are determined uh, to do what we can to repay uh, that debt. Uh, my understanding, although of course we will look into uh, the information that Joanne Lamont uh, has just provided to the Chamber, but my understanding is that so far uh, no application has been refused for lack of documentation. Now Joanne Lamont is giving uh, me different information and uh, I will make sure the Deputy First 
Resource Minister looks into that and will write to Joanne Lamont as soon as we're in the position to do so. Sandra White to be followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the announcement that CERCO are planning to resume their lock change eviction programme across Glasgow. Can the First Minister tell me what action the Scottish Government will take to prevent this inhumane treatment of asylum seekers by CERCO? First Minister. Well, I deeply, deeply regret CERCO's decision. I think it is inhumane that people can be evicted from their homes. Uh, by the locks being changed. Um, the Scottish Government has made its views known on this. We have uh, worked and will continue to work uh, with Glasgow City Council uh, to protect uh, asylum seekers uh, as much as we possibly can. But the root problem here is the inhumane asylum uh, policy pursued by the Home Office and the UK Government. That's what needs to change. Um, and perhaps Ruth Davidson, uh, given uh, her partnership at the moment with the, the current Home Secretary, will take the opportunity to ask the Home Secretary to end a situation where people can be evicted from their homes in this way. And I look forward to hearing from her when she's done so. Ian Gray to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Ian Gray. Figures today show that Scottish student debt has soared to five and a half billion pounds, three times what it was in 2007. Average individual debt is more than double what it was when the SNP came to power. When the First Minister says, judge her by her record on education, aren't Scotland students and graduates who were promised no student debt at all entitled to judge this a betrayal which grows bigger year by year? First Minister. Well, let me just uh, focus on uh, what exactly the loan debt figures uh, are. Uh, in England, uh, the individual loan debt figures are 35,950. Uh, in Labour-run Wales, £22,920. In Northern Ireland, £23,550. And in Scotland, £13,800. Some £9,000 uh, lower uh, than in Wales, where Labour are in government. Average student debt in Scotland did increase in the most recent year by £670. In Labour-run Wales, it increased by £1,610. Labour's hypocrisy on this issue knows no bounds. The fact of the matter is, we are increasing support for students, we are increasing student bursaries, and we are determined to keep education in Scotland free. That's the difference between the SNP, the Tories, Labour and the Liberals. Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Mark Griffin. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, today's Daily Record reports on the latest priority for the Tory party. They want their new Westminster leader to rip up the Scotland Act and to seize control of spending and decision making in devolved areas. Does the First Minister condemn this latest attempt at a power grab on Scotland's Parliament? First Minister. Well, I think, um, I think everything the Tories do and say right now, uh, and in fact the shrill way in which they, they say it, just demonstrates that they know they are losing the argument on independence. So they are reduced to trying to frustrate democracy. The Tories are not interested in more money for Scotland. If they were, they'd have stood up against the cuts imposed upon this parliament by the Tory government. What the Tories are interested in is undermining the Scottish parliament. Uh, we've already had the legislative power grab. Uh, we've seen this week the petty, though completely unsuccessful attempt to constrain the ability of the Scottish and Welsh governments to represent our interests overseas and now we have the money grab. You know, I think we're learning two things. Firstly, the Tories cannot be trusted with devolution. But the second thing is perhaps more interesting. The Tories, the Tories know, the Scottish Tories know they are never going to be in government in Scotland because if they had any hope of that, they wouldn't be allowing a Tory government to undermine this parliament in the way that they are. Mark Griffin, to be followed by Emma Harper. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware of press reports that the GMB union are battling 300 members of staff at Hare Myers Hospital on taking strike action. A payroll system change means collectively they owed £72,000, are being paid two weeks' wages for three weeks' work, 
and have been offered a loan instead of wages they're rightfully owed, pushing many into debt. <coughs> Will the Scottish Government make a public intervention in this, in line with the wishes of the workforce, to make sure staff are paid what they are owed, avert any strike action and the likely knock-on effect for patients in my region? First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary has already uh, made public intervention. She's written to the company. She's met with the union concerned uh, and continues to encourage uh, the company to adopt an approach which is uh, fair to staff and uh, also avoids any disruption to services. And we will continue uh, to do everything we can as a government to bring about that resolution. Uh, of course, uh, this issue uh, comes from the PFI uh, contract uh, around Hermeyer's Hospital, which uh, I seem to remember came about uh, under the last Labour administration. So this is one of the symptoms of PFI that Labour was so happy to support all these years ago and now has the nerve to stand up in this Parliament and complain about. So we will continue to do the work we can to resolve it. But perhaps Labour should spend a bit more time reflecting on why we find ourselves in this situation. Emma Harper. To ask whether the Scottish Government has had any contact from Dumfries and Galloway Council following the closure of Church Street in Stranraer due to safety concerns over the dilapidated Grade B listed George Hotel and whether assistance could be offered. First Minister. Uh, well, we'll be happy uh, to liaise with the Council and do everything we can to help uh, with this situation, which I know uh, is of concern to Emma Harper's constituents. Uh, I'd be happy to ask the relevant Minister to look further into this um, and get back to Emma Harper as soon as possible. Thank you. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to make people aware of scams in light of reports that nearly half of people in Scotland have been targeted at least once in the last year. First Minister. Uh, the number of people targeted by scams is uh, of great concern. The Scottish Government believes that prevention through education and raising awareness is key to reducing the harm caused. Uh, we are currently funding Citizens Advice Scotland to deliver an awareness campaign in partnership with Trading Standards, Police Scotland, Young Scot, Age Scotland and other agencies. Uh, the campaign launched this week and aims to challenge perceptions and stigma associated with scams, urging people to speak up and report them. We also fund Crime Stoppers, who have been working with Police Scotland on the Shut Out Scammers campaign to raise awareness of doorstep crime and protect the most vulnerable in society. Uh, we're also currently working with stakeholders to develop a prevention strategy to ensure a more coordinated response to tackling this issue across government. Stuart McMillan. And I thank the First Minister for that reply. And does the First Minister agree with me that the Citizens of Ice Scotland and Police Scotland's efforts to make people aware of scams are welcome? However, we should all remain vigilant and highlight that whether or not scammers are successful, they are committing a crime. And does the First Minister also agree uh, with me that I can, this is a continual problem and we need uh, to continue that partnership working to both raise people's awareness as well as target these criminals? First Minister. Uh, yes, I agree with all of that. We must be vigilant and report any concerns uh, to the police, regardless of whether or not a scammer is successful. Uh, as I've just said, the Scottish Government is working with a range of partners to embed uh, cyber resilience within our education and lifelong learning systems at all levels, and that will help to ensure that everyone has a fundamental awareness of uh, cyber risk and how they can take basic but important steps to reduce uh, that risk. Uh, I very much agree that this is an ongoing problem and partnership working of the type that I spoke about in my initial answer will be key uh, to raising awareness and preventing uh, crimes of this nature. And Maurice Corrie. Officer, the Scottish Conservatives called for a vulnerable persons aggravator almost exactly a year ago after it was recommended by the Brackadale Review. This would see those who commit crimes targeted at the elderly and disabled punished more harshly by the courts. Why has the SNP government failed to introduce this? First Minister. Well, we obviously consulted uh, on changes to hate crime legislation. Uh, the uh, results of that are currently uh, being taken forward and Parliament will continue to scrutinise the decisions government makes and ultimately the decisions uh, Parliament makes. It is important uh, that we consider carefully any aggravations to crime, uh, making sure that we have the right evidence base in place and that we're taking the right action to protect vulnerable groups, whoever they are, and we will continue to take uh, action of that type. Question number five, Jamie Green. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to strike action taking place at Glasgow and Aberdeen airports. First Minister. 
Well, it's very disappointing that this industrial action is taking place. It is a matter for EGS airports uh, and the trade union, and I would encourage them to work together to reach a resolution to the dispute. Um, I appreciate that the strikes will be concerning for passengers, particularly as we enter the summer holiday season. Uh, I know that measures have been put in place to minimise the impact on passengers and no flights have been cancelled at either airport because of the industrial action. But I would uh, urge AGS airports and Unite to continue talks to resolve this matter and uh, avoid any disruption to passengers. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that response? The First Minister will no, no doubt be aware of the strategic importance of the airport to both the city but the wider west of Scotland region to both business and tourism and I'm sure the same can be said of Aberdeen. Uh, given that there are potential further strikes planned and this is the peak travel season uh, upon us, it is important this dispute is resolved fairly but quickly. So can I ask uh, uh, for further information on how the government, its ministers or indeed its agencies will provide assistance to either party to help settle this dispute quickly? First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is not a party to this dispute and I'm sure that is appreciated. That said, the Scottish Government always stands ready to help if there is help that we can provide to help uh, resolve uh, disputes like this. But this is fundamentally an issue between uh, the airport company and the trade unions. I would, as I did a moment ago, encourage them to work together with a view to reaching a resolution that will avoid disruption for passengers, but also a resolution that is fair to the workers in the airports. Um, this, uh, the airport company is a private company, so we don't have a direct role in the talks, but of course we want to see it resolved as quickly as possible. And if there is anything that we can reasonably do to help bring about that outcome, we stand ready to do it. And Neil Bibby. Uh, hundreds of workers in my region have been forced to strike because their pay and pensions have been attacked in violation of an ACAS agreement and strike-breaking labour is being used despite serious safety concerns. Unite have repeatedly offered to talk up and to uh, strike action. Yet the airport, which has made over £90 million of profits, will not work with the union to end this dispute. Given the airport's vast profits, profits that are projected to grow by a further 6%, can the First Minister justify why workers, hundreds of workers in my region should be treated in this way? First Minister. Um, the, the Scottish Government is not a party to this dispute. AGS Airports is a private company, but I was uh, very deliberate in what I said in my previous, an previous answer, that I want to see a resolution to this that avoids uh, passenger disruption, but that is also fair uh, to those who work in the airport because uh, as with any company it cannot function uh, without the work uh, of the employees there so I want to see fairness for workers um, I would encourage the airport to get round the table with trade unions and come to a resolution and I hope all members will do so but you know it has to be based on a recognition that this is not uh, a dispute that the Scottish Government is a party to that doesn't stop us encouraging those who are parties to this dispute to get round the table and come up with a solution that is fundamentally a fair one. And question number six, Jackie Bailey. For what reason only £3.2 million out of a £200 million Scottish European co-investment programme has been spent on supporting Scottish businesses? <coughs> First Minister. Uh, the Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Programme uh, has provided £12 million of investment so far. The £3.2 million uh, referred to is the Scottish Enterprise contribution uh, and refers to deals uh, or includes deals currently being finalised. Uh, there have been some challenges to take up of the scheme, including ongoing uncertainty around Brexit. Scottish Enterprise is continuing to work with investors and companies to secure investment decisions and maximise the number of businesses uh, who benefit from the scheme. Uh, the Government is committed to supporting small businesses. Of course, the co-investment programme is just one part of the Scottish Growth Scheme, which is funding a range of financial interventions aimed at helping SMEs realise their growth and export ambitions. And the Growth Scheme overall has supported 158 companies with £125 million of investment so far. Jackie Bailey. Um, I have to say to the First Minister, 12 million out of 200 million isn't that much better. At a time where the economy appears to be contracting, manufacturing is declining, and small business confidence, according to the Clydesdale Bank SME Health Check Index, is at its lowest level since they started recording it. When the fund was announced in the programme for government in 2016, it was welcomed across this chamber. It was designed to help businesses grow in the face of Brexit. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance claimed this week that the very fund to help prepare for Brexit had been affected by Brexit. Can the First Minister tell me whether the Scottish Government completely misread the market 
given that there is so little demand? And will the co-investment programme, which is largely financial transaction money, be revised to ensure that the right help is available for businesses in these very difficult times? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, in response to that last part of the question, of course, we will always look at how we make sure that we are providing the kind of help that businesses need. And if we need to make changes to the design of programmes, we will uh, certainly do that. But I think most people would uh, understand and appreciate that Brexit has had and is having an impact on investment decisions. Um, and that is having a knock-on impact in the number of companies that are coming forward to schemes like this. And that is simply a reality that I would have thought Labour at the very least if not the Tories would have uh, been able to understand uh, but the growth scheme overall is helping a number of companies as I said 158 companies with 125 million pounds of investment so far and we'll continue to do everything we can to make sure that this uh, very helpful funding gets to companies uh, but we require companies to come forward with investment propositions uh, and we will keep encouraging them to do so. And Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the 2016 programme for government, the First Minister announced that the Scottish Growth Scheme would provide £500 million of loans and guarantees to business. But support under this scheme is now largely in the form of equity finance. So can the First Minister explain why Scottish firms now have to sell part of their business, often to foreign fund managers, in order to get support under the Scottish Growth Scheme? First Minister. There's a range of financial interventions that are available and there will be discussions with companies about what suits their business needs most, uh, whether that is loan funding um, or other forms uh, of funding into uh, businesses. Uh, but I would have hoped that uh, a Conservative member would also have recognised that these uh, these schemes are impacted right now by companies' reluctance to invest because of the Brexit yeah. uncertainty. And for a Tory in particular to ask a question about this, uh, seemingly oblivious to that, I think just underlines the fact that the Tories have no regard whatsoever to the damage their policies are doing to the economy of the UK right now. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Julian Martin on World Environment Day 2019. But we'll just take, in fact, we'll have a short suspension to allow members, the Minister and members of the public gallery to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>